Welcome to Livin and Marcelo's Criminology Podcast, a podcast hosted by Marcelo Aevi from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland, and Livin Powers from Ghent University, Belgium. We aim to draw a map of the state of criminology across Europe through the words of contemporary criminologists. How is criminology defined and taught? Which are the main lines of research? Which are the main schools of thought in each country? These and many other questions are answered here by fellow researchers who share their vision on the development of criminology in their countries from its beginnings to the second decade of the 21st century. If you want to know and compare their stories, stay tuned. Today, we are interviewing Professor Ernesto Savona. Ernesto Savona is the director of Transcrime Joint Research Center of the Universidad Católica del Sacro Cuore and the Universidad degli Studi di Trento, and since 2003, Professor of Criminology at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan. This interview was conducted on 18 March 2022. Welcome, Ernesto Savona, to uh, Live and Marcelo's Criminology Podcast. Uh, it's difficult to introduce you to the audience um, because you have done so many things, but uh, as we can see from your uh, screen, you are you created Transcrime, this uh, uh, major institute of, of research. Um, you were in, in different universities with this um, research center, and you've been a professor uh, of criminology also in different universities. You've been a president of the European Society of Criminology, one of the founding members too. We thought that uh, it would be impossible to try to see uh, what is um, Italian criminology today without having you to, to help us. So, welcome. Thanks, Marcelo and Levan, for inviting me to this interview. Uh, I think it's a very good idea, excellent especially for those people who will come after us. I hope they will be interested in knowing how the fathers and grandfathers have been treating criminology as a pioneer in some, because uh, also in Italy, I think we can speak about criminology pioneers, uh, not very well developed, but still today, it's a good discipline and students are coming. Exactly. So just to uh, to arrive to the the situation uh, today, uh, maybe uh, we should start uh, with the beginning. But seeing it from the outside, uh, one gets the impression that there was like one big, let's say, explosion at the beginning with the um, uh, with the Italian school of criminology, and then somehow what we do not get at, at this from the outside is what happened between the 1930s and the 1970s, because then it's your generation that arrives. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think at the beginning we know these people, Ferry, Lombroso in some ways, uh, a lot of uh, very relevant uh, names that uh, could be called as the founding fathers of criminology in Italy more than in Europe. Uh, uh, in the first part of the 19th century, I, uh, these people were not very well known outside the borders of Italy. This belongs to, let me put, uh, before the Second World War. With the Second World War, there is a, a, things are changing. Uh, a publisher such as Molino has been translating uh, a lot of books coming from the U.S., uh, Martin Wolfgang uh, works with Franco Ferracuti, who is a very well-known criminologist uh, coming from medicine, but very open to social sciences in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, more and more criminology has developed in the second part of the century with uh, uh, very few chairs in uh, criminology in mainly belonging uh, to psychopathology. Uh, the school of Genoa is the most prevalent. 
So there is a continuity between the first part of the century and the second part of the century through the school of clinical criminology, but very open. Let me put Canepa. I remember one of the fathers of this clinical criminology in Genoa, uh, who has been opening his arms to contribution of other people. I was invited in uh, the conferences they did in Syracuse at that time. So putting it together, key persons, Ferracuti from one side, Canepa on the other side, single people, criminology has been slowly developing uh, uh, in uh, the universities and uh, mainly in the faculties of medicine. This is something uh, that many people uh, did not like, but it's a part of the history. Moving to the Faculty of Law, I was the first full professor in the Faculty of Law in 1986, uh, only one, uh, me, in Trento, who was a very modern and open Faculty of Law, School of Law, and this is the main reason why they got a professor who was not a physician. After me, in the Law Faculty, things have been moving, and today we have uh, more than one professors in political science and sociology faculties. In few words, uh, criminology has been developing from uh, uh, psychopathology, still existing very strong, to social sciences. Uh, uh, re I think following the Anglo-Saxon model today, in uh, young generation. So you have two main pillars, if you want to put it in this way. One is the uh, clinical criminology, which is uh, continuing uh, with many differences, the school uh, of uh, psychopathology, uh, very good people uh, open to different disciplines. And the second branch is the social sciences following the American model. Um, for some reasons that could not be understood, lawyers in Italy has been uh, against criminology, putting as sub-discipline of criminal law. So today we don't have, uh, we should have, but we don't have a, a branch which is following the legal culture, which is very prevalent in Italy also. So not many people doing criminal law are doing criminology. Uh, the, you mentioned there are two, two key persons, uh, Ferracuti and, and Canepa. So there is, I think with Ferracuti, there is this tradition of um, Italians, cr Italian criminologists working abroad. Eh? He is the only one that uh, in uh, the 60s went to Philadelphia to work with Martin Wolfgang. And uh, he was uh, working also in Puerto Rico for the American governments. Ferracuti was a person working half and half, half in the US and half in uh, Italy. And uh, he was a brilliant man uh, with a degree in um, medicine, but very open to social sciences. I met him, I worked with him slowly, but uh, on the end of his career, he was really uh, very, he started to do what we call a private profession, making consulting, uh, to a lot of different people. So studying less, making more money on the end. Um, perizia, as we call, expertise for the tribunal. But Ferracuti is the person who has been linking with the US and with also the Cambridge Institute, uh, where you had the, um, the British American uh, professor who is uh, the name and the library of the Cambridge Institute today. So these are the people with whom uh, Ferracuti born, uh, also Norval Morris, I met. Uh, he belongs to this piece of history between the 50s uh, during the war, Second World War and after immediately the Second World War. Yeah. And, and there is also a tradition, a link with the French, French speaking world. Eh? I think that Canepa, for example, had these connections with the Montreal School via Zabo, eh? Yeah. Ratzinovich, as you mentioned, <laughs> and then Zabo in, in Montreal. 
The boy Montreal was he created the comparative school of criminology in Montreal. The boy is a relevant man. He, as I remember, he was Hungarian by birth. Yeah, and, exactly. went, and he went away from Hungarian. I think in '56 probably. Yeah, the, the invasion, the Russian invasion. So he went to Montreal and he uh, set up a school of uh, comparative criminology, which is today probably the most relevant French language school uh, in, in the north part of America. Yeah, I I have the impression that he was a, a man who had read everything. Eh? But uh, at that time, um, there was also a link, I think, for your generation. Because when I see also some uh, movie directors in uh, in Italy, they have this link with the with the French. Eh? Most of them, uh, uh, okay, they, they are they are older than you, but Fellini, all these guys, they all uh, speak um, French. And uh, I don't know at, uh, up to which point the, the books of Sabo had an influence on the development of uh, of criminology, of or it was mainly the, the Italian, the English tradition. Eh? Because you mentioned in Molino translating uh, English. Uh, remember, Marcelo, that French is the language of diplomacy, and many Italians speak uh, um, French only with the Second World War. After in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the young generation moves to English, but until the 70s, uh, the, uh, also in the European Union, the prevalent language is the French, until the Swedish joined to the European Union. Before it was mainly French. So mm. French, but French is not the language of criminology at all. You know today, except for the Belgian, French is not the language of criminology. The only person I met with whom I spoke he was a little complex, psychologically speaking, Philippe Robert. But uh, Philippe Robert was the only person who said the criminology does not exist. It's uh, sociology of deviance. Ernesto, don't speak about the criminology, you speak about uh, sociology of deviance. And his journal was uh, in yeah. line with his belief. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look today to criminologists uh, as we speak about this word, in all Europe, uh, going from England to Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Hungary, uh, and Romania, and the other countries, uh, for some cultural reasons, uh, with single individuals in France, you don't find many. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So yeah. if, we, if we would like to define criminology in Italy, we will have this problem that you mentioned of the different uh, branches. Yeah? I think you can use a, a very comprehensive definition. Uh, usually when I speak to the students, I say criminology is a science of crime studying authors, and this is really clinical criminology, victims. Victimology has been introduced later on. Uh, Viano is a, an American-Italian who came to Italy and uh, started teaching victimology. He had a journal, Emilio Viano. Ah, he's an American Italian. He's a, he was born in America. He is born in Italy, in Turin, uh, but he is living in, um, in the United States for a long time. Ah. And he was uh, uh, on uh, the 70s and the 80s. He came to Italy called by Balloni, who was another professor of criminology coming from medicine. Uh, so mm -hmm. he exported uh, victimology in some ways uh, as a journal. But victimology, after uh, it's a part of criminology and has been developing uh, slow, but uh, quite relevant, especially because uh, um, the attention was put only not only to the authors, but also to the victims. The contribution of Viano and the victimology was uh, not only authors, but uh, look to victims and look to the relationships between authors and victims. So this could be the first part of the definition. If you add the development of the discipline, you can introduce a, an attention to activities of committing crime, what criminals do. It's very important for the new theories uh, about situational prevention, for example, what they do. And uh, recently, there is a new attention, I think, which is quite relevant, at least for me, uh, crime consequences. You want to look and estimate 
what are the consequences of crime, not only on victims, how much does it cost crime? So today, if you put authors, victims, activities, and crime consequences, so you have a quite complex definition of the different fields that are discussed and covered by the different criminology that are existing in Italy. Yeah, that is very interesting what you say, because um, my first contact with the Italian criminology was through uh, Alessandro Baratta and uh, yeah. critical criminology. And um, I was so happy when I arrived uh, here and found that uh, you were doing um, also other things, you know, and um, if we talk about the institutionalization of criminology, there was there were these uh, I think uh, uh, specializations in criminology, eh? but then you you managed to create in in Milano both a, a master and a PhD program. I created the PhD in Trento, uh, where I stayed for 17 years in the Faculty of Law, and uh, uh, inside transcribe. So what I did in Trento was first set up the center, and after set up a PhD program which was the international PhD in criminology with a lot of colleagues coming from other countries. This was quite innovative. And uh, people working with you, such as Stefano, for example, belong to this uh, PhD. When I moved to the Catholic University in 2002, I brought with me two things, the center, transcribe, and the PhD program. Today, you are part of the PhD program run by Francesco Calderoni, so there is a continuity. And as everybody knows, uh, the perspective of transcribe and of the PhD in criminology are much more belonging to the Anglo-Saxon tradition than to the psychopathology or clinic. We have a very good relation with... Uh, Isabella Merzagola was a researcher with me for a few time in Trento. She was with me. Also, if she was belonging to another perspective, but she was a very competent person. But the, the dialogue with Uberto Gatti, Baldini, the other people, uh, it's excellent, which means uh, these people are very open uh, to what we do. Let me say that the borders between the clin clinical criminology and social science criminology are not so big. So we discuss each other, we can cooperate each other. Yeah. One thing that maybe is interesting for the, for the speakers is that um, the history of uh, the PhDs in, uh, in Italy in general is a, a recent history because there was not this tradition. Even the book of, uh, of Umberto Eco, uh, How to Write a Dissertation, is yeah. Come si scrive una tesi de laurea. So it was a master dissertation. So this was something new, the, the, um, or relatively, now it's 30 years probably, but it, it doesn't have the, the same history as in other countries, no? Yeah. No, no, it's uh, the PhD in criminology I set up in Trento and after Milan was the only one PhD in criminology uh, for a long time. You have a lot of scuole di specializzazione and still today, but it's quite different from a PhD. The PhD is bringing you to the academic career, the Scuola di Specializzazione, uh, consistent with the theories uh, of criminological, clinic criminology, bring you to the expertise with tribunals, which are two different things. Yeah. So this explains why PhD in criminology were not very developed because there was not an academic interest in criminology. Having a PhD, uh, things have been moving slow, but uh, today there are some prof full professor in criminology, you know, many associate professor, and uh, what we have done from Milan, uh, bef before in Trento and Milan, exporting to the UK a lot of criminologists. I, think. I have more people uh, in UK than in Italy today, so, uh, and this explains that the, the, there is a a structural difficulty for the Italian Academy to recruit criminology in the social sciences faculties. We have a, Francesco Calderoni is a full professor. You have a professor of sociology of deviance, but uh, Becucci is also a professor which comes from my PhD. I am very happy that Anita Lavonia is coming back to Italy now from Southampton. And uh, you have single people 
coming or going, uh, which are in line with what we call the social science tradition, Anglo-Saxon tradition. Yeah, that's that was precisely my point. The the, the bridge between uh, Ferracuti, then you mentioned Viano, that I did not remember at, at the moment immediately, and then there is also all the people from your uh, PhD that are uh, placed in different uh, in different countries. I mean, it's quite impressive because um, well, I, I, part, I have participated many times in in, uh, in the commission. I think I was no, I think no, I know I was in the commission of uh, of uh, Francesco. <laughs> I, I have his uh, his PhD dissertation there, but it's it's impressive how these people found their place uh, in many other um, places, especially in the in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, I've been fighting, but today Francesco, who is the only full professor who stays with me at Transcrime, he is forty one years old, which means uh, in relation to the Ac Italian Academy. He is very, very young, extremely young, yeah. because uh, 41 years old, uh, you have a, a researcher, not a full professor, you know? This, the average uh, age of a full professor in Italy is 55. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a real difference. So that is the, the, the success of your PhD program, but also I think the master program, um, yeah. We can learn something about how you put it in place with the, with the, some private to public partnership also. Eh? This was the reason. Well, I remember that I in 2002, I moved to a private university such as the Catholic University in Milan. And we set up, a, 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 following the rules, we set up a, a two years master program, public policy uh, with a curriculum on security and uh, with uh, a numerous clauses of 40 people recruitment, and this was the good idea. Not too many people, but uh, invest in 40. And today, uh, I'm happy to say that at least uh, the 90% of these people is arriving to the degree with a contract in his pocket, which means because what we did, and this was, uh, being Milan was essential, Private industries are recruiting them for the security services in the industry. So also, if they could go to the public, they don't go to the public. They stay inside the security organization. Uh, on the end, it happens what has been happening uh, also in the Netherlands. Many people go to Ernest Young, Deloitte, uh, uh, KPMG. Uh, these are the main recruiters of these people. Uh, I think uh, my colleague uh, in the PhD was explaining to me that uh, the main recruiters in the Netherlands, probably also in Belgium, are all these big firms, which means uh, they recruit young people and after they move the young people to big industries. So I remember speaking with uh, uh, Van der Bund. This was in Rotterdam quite clear. But uh, in order to arrive there, you have to... Uh know what these private companies want. Eh? And perhaps you can explain us how you did it, because we can yeah. learn something about that. Well, of course, I was uh, very, I was quite alone when I moved to the Catholic University, but the environment was positive because the university was giving me credit to do things. Of course, with Transcrime, I was uh, uh, importing money from the European Union uh, and the university was taking a fee on this money. So they were very happy not putting in the things. When I set up this master, uh, I started inviting the big industries. Uh, who was really hesitant, let me say, inviting them in the, in the room, uh, explaining what they do uh, to the students. So these started the mechanisms where People uh, of the inside the industries, I'm speaking about telecom or big any Pirelli, all these big firms that are in Milan, we are going to the uh, class explaining what is the security office. Uh, they were developing the security office. So these people become also lecturing there. So we have today among the different professors some of these people of the big industries still teaching there. 
But we have been growing a generation. We are today recruiting the students of the 10 years ago, you know, which means they've been working. Now today they are going up, up in a very high position inside this industry. So they are becoming the professors of this uh, policy master. And this is extremely interesting because they are, there is the loyalty toward us. And these are the students I grow up 10 years ago. And today these are the colleagues we are uh, experiment. Um, consider one thing, the university was not putting money for these professors, or at least a very small amount of money, but big fees. Uh, this is the problem. Uh, but being Milan, the city where you find a lot of industries, and being still uh, teaching at university a prestige, so these people are doing without money. So today, uh, I think things are going very well. Uh, we have a one difficulty that from the master, it's not very easy to bring people to the PhD for the reason of the success, because uh, in the master, the people go immediately to the industry. They earn much more money than they earn in the PhD scholarship. So we have today a lot of difficulties in moving these people from one to the other because they learn to be practical, to manage security, not to do research. Yeah, but that is extremely interesting because I remember maybe um, when I started going to the PhD, maybe 15 years ago already, or, or more or less like that, you had a, a lot of persons in the PhD every year. And then yeah. you reduced it. Um, you have, And this is related to what you're explaining now. Also because you are very selective eh, for the PhD. We try to be very selective and some people leave after one year because what we ask to these people, it's a lot. And, uh, uh, but uh, Marcelo, it's better to be selective on the beginning instead of uh, being selecting uh, on the end, because on the end they will not find any job. Uh, the market is extremely competitive. And the reason why they go to UK today, because UK is very attractive for salaries, uh, much more than Italy and uh, for an academic career. But still, I think the problem we have, it's uh, when I was in Trento in the Faculty of Law, it was much more attractive because the law students, for some reasons, uh, are very uh, are very attracted by criminology. Uh, and I think it's a total stupidity when the Faculty of Laws are not starting classes of criminology because the criminology in the Faculty of Law, it's very successful. And in the Faculty of Law, you find a lot of very intelligent students, uh, more than you find in a social science faculty. Today, criminology in the Catholic University is allocated in the political and social science faculty, not law. In Trento, it was law, but people with such as Francesco and Stefano, they come from law. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, I mean, you are aware that you are in the good sense, a sort of anomaly in the Italian system, because the classic Italian professor uh, is not, or in, at least the ones that I know mainly in criminology, and they are, they don't have this contact with the with the private uh, world uh, that you have, uh, and that you develop, and that help creating this this very specific special program. Yeah, it's the need, it's the market, the demand. I was looking for money. Everywhere I could find money for scholarship, <laughs> I was going. And I was really, well, I was a professor in the Catholic University, which is a very high prestige faculty. So I was going there and say, could you give me a scholarship, uh, Pirelli? You are producing tires. Uh, and I would like to have a scholarship for the PhD. Let me say, Marcelo, that it was quite uh, positive. I got many, pos many scholarship. Any Pirelli, Telecom, Gucci. Gucci was one of the uh, donors which gave to me a lot of scholarships, for example. Uh, they were not linking scholarships with uh, the field of criminal of the PhD, but they recruited some of the PhD students uh, on the end of their career. Yeah. Today, Gucci has uh, some people with PhD also. Yeah, that is so interesting because uh... I mean, it's not well known how it how it works, eh? because all these PhD students they usually they get this fellowship, yeah. these fellowships that that you obtain from the private industry, and then um, and then you also have the persons from these companies teaching, 
I think it's like a perfect deal that you made. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> there is no other way. I mean, I hope the other will continue. I think uh, I set up a mechanism. Today, um, things are moving, and I think Francesco is it's continuing. In, the problem is that we find the scholarships in the different places, uh, not as many as before, but still I think the mechanism works quite well. The problem is about the recruitment, uh, where these people, or PhD candidates, come from. This is the main problem. Uh, you said that from the master is difficult because they find already a place, but you also get the students uh, from abroad. I think you also cultivated these links with them. Um, with, uh, with Europe. Huh? Do you think this, in terms of what is going on in Italy, I remember you organized in Milano maybe three years ago yeah. before the pandemic, this meeting about the future of criminology. Eh? Well, some people are coming from outside. Uh, the last one was Thomas Joyce. You met, uh, uh, yeah. he's uh, Irish and he was very good as a student and candidate. For sure, I think, um, there has been some foreigners, not many, of course, because doing a PhD in Italy is a challenge and it's easier to do in the UK or in the Netherlands, for example. But still, uh, it works. Considering that uh, university provides only one scholarship, but uh, the threshold is that you need to have a four scholarship to start. So you need to find the other three scholarships in some ways. Ah, that's the rule at the university. The rule of the university is this one. And we are trying to find everywhere, paying with the money of research. Uh, the transcribe is very unique uh, in some ways. Uh, being unique is not a very good thing. Where we, um, with applied research, feed basic research which means the uh, Universidad Católica is not providing us uh, with uh, more than one scholarship. But in order to have more than one, we pay for our scholarship on the money of research. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that, <laughs> that is really quite impressive. And do you think that after, uh, after that meeting in Milano, where, where you invited people from everywhere, do you think there is a chance that criminology will become somehow institutionalized? I think it, it, it takes time, uh, especially if those people who are representing uh, the academic level, the criminology, will do well. Uh, for sure, there is some resistance in what we call the clinical criminology, because uh, if you speak about clinical criminology in the American side of criminology or in the European side of criminology, you will not find many people doing clinical criminology. But it's still... so. Uh, I think the future of criminology in Italy belongs to the Anglo-Saxon tradition in some ways, which means uh, more quantitative uh, with some qualitative component, but uh, quantitative is uh, quite relevant, which means and solicits also the data finding, which means uh, and uh, pushing uh, producers of data to have a quite uh, a relevant uh, uh, database. This is really part of my job uh, or the job of the, my co young colleagues to solicit public authorities to produce quite relevant data. For example, let me make an example. Five years ago, crime and place was absolutely not known in Italy. I remember I, I made a, a speech at the Ministry of Interior explaining them how it's relevant to collect data about crime and police for reorganizing the law, the police system, allocating more on those places where there is a concentration of crime and leaving in the other place where there is less concentration of crime. This was a, a seminal discussion that produced, uh, after a month, uh, an investment from the Ministry of Interior in uh, uh, including in the database about uh, reported crime, also the place. Of course, in the beginning, where were they uh, mentioning place in a very rough way. But today, they are capable to map crime and place. This explains to you that slowly and slowly, we can, uh, with uh, quite a good relationship sometime with these people, we can really produce quite innovative 
theories from some places. I invited David Weisberg one time and together with the head of the Italian police, combining to the two people today together, explaining one to the other. And, uh, and the head of the police said, after having heard me and David Weisberg say, if I apply what Professor Savona asks me to do, I will uh, I will discuss with I will invite Professor Savona to discuss with unions about uh, uh, and this will be an impossible job unions of police because I was asking him to reduce the amount of the police in those places where there is no crime and to concentrate where there is a concentration of crime. So things work in some ways. It's the same thing for situational prevention explaining to the law enforcement um, managers what situational prevention means, it's a, a difficult job. Uh, they understand, but implementing it, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Can I um, ask a question about the implementation? Today we have an increasing um, discussion about also the need for evaluation, and I mean, that requires in the master and PhD programs a lot of methodology which is um, sometimes forgotten or basically only quantitative or only qualitative. So I think this is a very um, interesting challenge um, you're talking about. I find the idea of two years master programs more suitable for developing, I mean, future researchers than the one year master program. But um, in many countries, we only have one year master program in criminology, of course, in combination with uh, bachelor um, degree. You know, Levin, uh, all the people uh, doing the job of policemen uh, have a degree in mainly in law. For, this is the very big problem in Italy, which means uh, they know everything about procedural law, criminal law, civil law, Roman law, and everything. For applying for the concourse or the competition, they need a degree in law. At least they need to study a lot of legal classes. They Just recently, they asked them to know something about criminology because they train them after having selected okay. in the Academy of Police of the Academy of Carabinieri in the Academy of the... So in few words, uh, uh, these bodies... Uh, do not recognize uh, to criminology a very high component uh, because to enter you need to be a good lawyer this is the problem we uh, the result is that uh, good students such as the people in milan we have which could theoretically apply with the degree they have to the public competition to become policemen none of this person applies none on 40, because they have no interest at all. So the job of policemen in Italy, uh, differently from other countries, is not very well considered in terms of prestige. A good student in law applies for judge. Police is a residual job or something where you are really highly motivated for different psychological reasons. But uh, in the prestige scale of Italy is not. All the managers of the police, Italian police and Carabinieri have a degree in law mainly, or political science. This is a difference. In, in Belgium, we have, I mean, at, at least uh, we talk about the, the higher um, levels, the higher level officers, they um, have studied criminology um, or sometimes a combination of criminology and law. This is also very attractive to, I mean, the police and, and the judicial world, but um, at least this is, a, I think, an important challenge for the, the yeah. future. I think it will move up very slowly because bureaucracy is quite high, but I think in Italy it will be, uh, if you look to the landscape in Europe, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, UK, for example, which is different, I pick up these three countries the level of police is higher than in Italy at the moment. In terms of quality, after you can find very good people, very good experts, individually speaking, I'm speaking about a system of recruitment in this way. The capability for the system to select people, uh, this is the reason when you speak about crime and place, it's not easy to be understood. 
uh, they ask you, what do you mean? And you explain, look, 80% of crimes are concentrated in 20% of places, but the cultural people, it's a completely different thing. So after you find individuals that in their career, they open their arms to you, they are very, uh, but uh, we have quite good relations with these people of the Italian police and carabinieri uh, for exchanging of Guardia di Finanza data and evaluation of this data. But uh, uh, different from you and the Netherlands colleagues, uh, we never take money from them. So they don't pay us for uh, training them because they have their own academy. They will never give us money. Uh, we exchange data with uh, reports, uh, analysis, and other things. But in any case, you manage to um, change the statistics, and this is not a minor. <laughs> this is not a minor uh, achievement. Through this discussion with the um, with the police uh, officers, now you have this information that was not there in the statistics. Yeah. No. No. We. Uh, well, we have an agreement, formal agreement with the Italian police, Italian carabinieri, Italian Guardia di Finanza, where we have exchange of data for research purposes. Mm. Uh, uh, of course, we don't use for publications. Uh, I hope the people don't use them, but uh, we use only with the authorization of these bodies. Uh, but in any case, for example, in, um, if, if, you, if one looks at the history in the United States, there was this researcher Robinson that then practically disappear, who was fighting to have uh, conviction statistics. Yeah. He lost the fight with J. Edgar Hoover and the, the idea of uh, and selling of having police statistics. And he was insisting on how to make the statistics. And this is the case where you managed to, uh, to convince them. Maybe there is room also for um, cybercrime statistics to, um, to at least flag the offenses. Yeah, no, no, probably. And today we are in a very good position in terms of a cooperation with these people, which means we have access to the data of the Ministry of Interior. So I can get everything I want and I need in terms of uh, immediate statistics about uh, reported crime and recorded crimes. I have also access uh, because of an Horizon Project Proton with uh, the prison department. We got all the database of the prisoners uh, in the Italian prisons. And this was a very successful project because uh, we were capable to map to map all, uh, all those people belonging to mafia association which were closed in the Italian prison, which was really a very good thing. So uh, slowly you can persuade these people to provide you uh, with data. Of course, the data are absolutely dirty. You need to spend a lot of time to clean them. But in the end, this works very well. Yeah. But if we, if one thinks about the, the, the lines of research in Italy, I mean, you in Transcrime are doing a lot of different lines. Eh? This is really a, a complex market, Marcelo. Uh, we, uh, we need to consider that uh, there is no money for research available in Italy. Uh, just a very small amount of money. Uh, competitive, which means we don't have a Swiss fund, we don't have a Belgian fund, we don't have anything. So uh, being in the university, a private one, uh, the university does not have access uh, to the public funds for universities as it was in Trento. So if you want uh, still uh, to have transcribe and paying salaries, you need to have a this was really uh, to European money, which is becoming always very difficult. European money is fragmented in a lot of different sectors, from trafficking of human beings to cybercrime to uh, pedophilia, everything. So this brings you to be capable, if you want to be successful, to be capable to cooperate on different projects. I'm speaking about Horizon Europe program, program ISF programs on different sectors. Uh, we have a privilege about corruption, economic and financial crime, but not only today. Also, because if you look to the Horizon program, there's a variety uh, of sectors, but uh, you, are, you know the story. If you are a good researcher, you know I remember the, my American colleagues explained to me that if you are very capable to do research, 
you will be capable to do research on different topics. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's quite interesting what, what you're saying. And also it's somehow, uh, um, <laughs> um, I mean, going to the free market because finally you left the public university in this case was very productive against the discourse that the state should um, uh, should finance everything, which I'm not against, of course. Uh, but uh, your example is that uh, because you manage in a private university to create a master that does not exist anywhere else. Uh, well, the, the PhD you created when you were already in the public university, then you get these funds. So somehow um, this, this this free market seems to have worked quite well for you, huh? No, 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 it works very well. We were in uh, 10 Horizon projects. Uh, we have been uh, in the last uh, Horizon projects, Horizon Europe, we were in 10 different project proposals, which means it's a, 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 in a, a, a very good number because uh, it's a lottery Horizon program, which means uh, if you participate to 10, probably you can get one or two. For us, it's uh, very essential, which means that uh, we are doing very well in the area of uh, European projects, uh, Horizon projects specifically. specifically. Of course, uh, the problem uh, uh, is once again the problem. Uh, in, in these projects, PhD students are working. Thomas Joyce was one of the leader of the person in charge of the organizing the different projects. Of course, you teach, I teach to this, uh, when the PhD student comes uh, and starts a work, I sit with him explaining the different programs of the European Union. So there are other people under me which are explaining how to cooperate with a project. There are people learning to do a project. Also, the managers which are in transcribing, which are three, they know how to cooperate because, you know, the administrative burden in the Horizon project is extremely heavy. So you need to solve all this bureaucratic problem of the bureaucracy of the European Union. But we need this money to continue the experience. Without the European money, we could close. Okay, I think we about the, the, the situation in Italy, I think we, 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 we made a, a nice tour. In any case, just, just one last thing I wanted to say is that you have people that studied in, uh, in Milano, in, um, in Switzerland, uh, in Wales, in England. So there is um, a legacy, a clear legacy, I think, uh, that you are living. Do, do you think these people will come back ever to, to Italy or they will do their lives... Uh, probably abroad, which is even better for the reputation no, of, a, of a country also. My job is uh, really mentoring people uh, today with my age. So if the people go abroad, uh, I am happy. We can't recruit these people back because uh, the opportunity are small. And I think these people will continue the tradition with uh, a different uh, legacy, if you can, but uh, remembering the time they spent with us. But this is part of the job uh, of a university professor, uh, mentoring people, uh, um, helping them to grow up. And after uh, Thomas has been a person working with me three years as a PhD student, after he has left, stays in Ireland, I hope he will find a job. Uh, probably I will meet once again uh, Thomas in two or three years. He will remember the experience done with me and uh, continuing. I think these are the people that could develop a criminology in Italy, uh, but probably not only in Italy, somewhere else. Yeah, but I, in any case, I, I think it's, uh, it's it's quite interesting what you did in um, in 20 years in Milano plus yeah. the 17 previous years in Trento. Um, I was wondering, so uh, about uh, the typical subject of um, of Italian criminology was uh, the, the mafia um, structure. This seems to be less in, less important nowadays. Eh? Yeah, and, and we have seen that in 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 Transcrime you 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 deal with very different projects. But outside, uh, which which would you say are the main topics that are currently studied in uh, in Italy outside of the work that, that by Transcrime? But I think that if we go back to the mainstream, uh, which means could be crime and place, uh, you know, Marco Dugato is uh, developing quite good research in the area. If you uh, speak about situational prevention, we teach situational prevention in the master, for example, very intensive class, uh, which means a lot of different theories uh, related to situational prevention. 
And recently, I think there is a challenge I like very much, predictive criminology. It's something we are developing together with other people, and I will be predicting crime. Uh, of course, uh, it's not really something very easy, but means having good data that allow you to make good prediction. And this is the reason why I'm selling, or I want to sell to the law enforcement the capability to predict crime, asking them to produce uh, uh, good data and explaining that uh, better the data, better could be the predictions. I think in the future, uh, this is one of the challenges, of course. Uh, for sure, uh, today, the Organization for Law Enforcement, to whom we speak, because we speak to judges and law enforcement, as people implementing what we do, it's uh, really having a, a practical knowledge of the consequences of crime. I think, and this is the reason why I introduced it in the definition of criminology, consequences, crime consequences, because you need to be capable to evaluate the cost of crime. Anytime this allows you to make, to select, if you need to prevent or control this typology of crime instead of preventing and controlling other things of crime, you know? Quantifying the cost of crime. Many years ago, this was done in the UK. We are trying, I have a strong interest in how much does it cost organized crime or mafia group in Italy? It's very difficult to estimate this. But remember, Marcelo and Levin, that if you have a good synthetic indicators of cost, this will allow people to make choices, to select what you need to prevent or what you need not to prevent. Informed choices, exactly. Yeah, yeah. which means um, when I introduce in the definition of criminology consequences crime, that means uh, be capable to select cost, to evaluate cost. And uh, recently, there is an attention of the European Parliament to these. The European Commission has a strong interest in assessing the cost of organized crime. Things are moving slow, oh. not in relation to our life. Probably other people, Letizia Paoli has been doing something on the cost of organized crime. People are moving. They started with the cost of drug trafficking, for example, or drug. But today things are moving. Yeah. Yeah, that's positive. And, and there is another aspect that we did not manage is the, the journal. Eh? I think it also played a role the, the have that you have the, the European Journal of Criminal Policy and Research. Yeah, it, it came out in 2003 when I was uh, uh, between Trento and Milan and uh, I'm becoming the oldest uh, editor-in-chief of a European journal. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Uh, probably, uh, but for some reasons uh, Springer likes very much, so I'm continuing. In some ways, the journal, uh, I agree with you, is a good complement to the transcribe and uh, to, the, to the master and the PhD. Also, if uh, there is an internal rule that people of the PhD can't publish in the journal uh, I manage, so it's uh, we call uh, ethical rule. It could happen, but it's very rare, very rare. They go to publish outside. But I think it's a good compliment because, you know, Marcelo, the people working with me on the journal, they, are, they, they have the opportunity to read all the articles which are presented, to discuss with me and a senior who should be accepted, who should be denied. So they start refining criteria for their turn to publish the article in other journal. Yeah. So it's a good way for training the people. Yeah, using the journal, I mean, the only two persons I heard say that is you and also uh, Pierre Margot at the University of Lausanne in, in criminalistics, in forensic science, um, also had uh, the, this idea that people can learn a lot uh, and that we should trust them to do this, uh, these reviews. Huh? They read all the articles submitted. We decide in one week when you present an article on 10 days to say yes or no. And after, if yes, it goes to referees. But also in selecting the referees, you need to have an expertise because for a young PhD students, such as it was Thomas and today Deborah, and together with Alberto Aziani, 
it's a good law. Uh, it's a good. It's a good move because she or he understands the mechanisms when an article is good or is bad. He or she becomes starts readings and after evaluating. And when you are in the position of evaluating, you need to be fair, neutral, and learning what are the main indicators of the evaluation. Yeah, I think it's very instructive this interview because um, there are many discussions across Europe on how to institutionalize uh, criminology, and in some cases they go through the state, like uh, like uh, Spain, for example. The program is decided from uh, from the central government. But I think what you did, uh, creating an institution, going to uh, to the police, but also to the private enterprises, then getting European funds and getting a journal, it's a quite um, interesting program. The, the only comparison I could make is with uh, Sabo, who created also, uh, who developed criminology. He, um, I read quite a few things about him, and also I learned um, he has a, a biography. I, I didn't read it yet. He created yeah, this international school to attract people, a little bit like, like an international program, also yeah. an association of, of criminologists. And these, I think, are examples of how things can be done yeah, in an alternative way. I hope we will have people continuing this job because these jobs, setting up a mechanisms, institutions that will help to develop the field. So you never know who wants to go. You know, Marcelo, the typical uh, academic animal in, in Italy is a very individual approach. Let me say, it's. Uh, I think it's not only in Italy. An Italian professor, especially when he or she is a full professor, he starts uh, writing, making consultants, uh, of course, not spending time in recruiting money for other people or projects or other things. This is the typical uh, professor there. I hope the other people which uh, come after me will be capable to do these kind of things because uh, it is difficult. The psychology of the university professor in Italy is a, a typical individual approach, absolutely alone. Yeah. Only, only in the art sciences, you have a laboratory, an office where the people go, such as transcribe. But in the social sciences, you have an always individual approach. Yeah. And how would you explain this change? I mean, uh, in this podcast, we are not mainly interested in, in, the, in the, the person, uh, herself or himself, but maybe in the, uh, more in the what happens in the country. But I think in this case, it's interesting. It, was there, did something happen that make you not the typical Italian professor? Was it when you were in the States for some time? When I set up Transcam, it was 1994, uh, coming after four years working for the American government in Washington, D.C. And I thought that I got so much from my country that I should give back uh, something uh, of my experience to this country and to their people. And this was the reason why uh, I started Transcribe with a few students in the beginning. There was room for creating a, a lot of things. Uh, uh, could be part of the generosity of the person or could be part of the attitude to discuss with people uh, growing. I think we, in our age, also, I was much younger then, we start a, a mentoring process early uh, and continuing until the end, probably, of course, I'm mentoring more than before, but I think mentoring for a university professor is a, a main component of his job, uh, which means that he, he or she needs to assure continuity on his job. And this is very, very, very important. Explaining, growing, advising, hoping the people will remember him or her, and leaving the people grow. Children. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this, so, so you spent four years in Washington, eh? I spent four years in Washington. Uh, I, I was working for the National Institute of Justice. Uh, and I remember they offered me a permanent job there, but... Uh, at that time in Italy, things were changing, and the manipulator was, and I thought it was time to come back. But the experience with the National Institute of Justice was really very relevant. 
And this, uh, I, I learned what does it mean to work with the public bodies because the NIJ is a, a part of the Department of Justice. So during these four years, I was working with the Department of Justice, FBI, uh, local police, and uh, uh, it's much, it's really completely different from an academic position there. You run a project and you speak with all these people interviewing criminals uh, because they gave access to the interview with the criminals. So it's uh, very interesting. And I I said this could be a very good experience that I can transfer to Italy with a lot of difficulties. It's not the same thing, of course. Yeah, but it's quite interesting. And you also have a good relationship with the STAT, the National Institute of Statistics. Eh? Yeah. And we, we provide them, I think, you know, Giuseppina Muratore, the other people, uh, I think they've been doing a, a very relevant work recently, victimization survey, for example, every five years, of course, but this was launched. But in some ways, uh, statistics are changing and are much better than before. Of course, they conflict with the Ministry of Interior anytime because uh, the Minister of Interior does not give the statistics, the data to this, is that, or they give it to us, but it's, oh, the, you find all these things always in uh, in any country, I think. Yeah, but at least you have a, a, a national institute uh, running a victimization survey, which is, yeah. uh, I mean, also in Belgium, they, they have it and the Netherlands, but it's not so common, let's say, um, in, in southern countries, it's not at all uh, common to have this. Uh... No, the challenge of Jan van Dijk, I think, in having a, a, has been lost in some ways. Uh, this was a very good idea, but you still have the British very relevant, uh, but uh, not many around Europe and around the world also. You know, there is a, there is a big tradition now of, uh, uh, no, I mean, there is a big movement towards uh, victimization service in Latin American countries, like Mexico, Chile, Peru. They have been uh, doing uh, quite a lot of, a, a lot of research and um, at the Europe, it's true that at the European level, this did, this did not work uh, completely as, uh, as we thought. The idea of a European survey for the moment is not, uh, no, no, but Marcelo, you know that many of these countries don't have very good statistics, yeah. which means it's it's much easier, or at least it's less expensive, to set up a victim survey than making a, a real a database with all the reported crimes. So it's very good initiatives, but uh, if you go to data in Mexico, where you have also a, a good statistics institute, some... Uh, well, Mexico is one of the best because of the institute, but when you go in Peru or in other countries, you don't find many, many good crime statistics, absolutely, together. Yeah, and do you think that the fact that Unicri was established also in, in Italy played a role in this uh, interest in victimization service? Sometimes there are small th things that happen that can change things. Huh? I remember I was a Unicri consultant in 1991 when Jan van Dijk asked me to run uh, the first uh, Italian victimization survey. So this was supported by Unicri. Uh, Ugi was there also, and uh, I was consulted to Unicri. But um, for what I know, Unicri has not been developed any other victim service uh, after the 1991, I think, when Ugo Leone was director. Today, Unicri is another research institute. Uh, I have no contact with Unicri at all, but they have changed so many directors, people, uh, and other things. But I think they are doing quite well internationally. Okay, but in any case, uh, this, all this, um, uh, Italy attracted a lot of, um, uh, of, of projects of this, of this kind. Eh? And I think uh, Unicri is also financed by the Italian government. Eh? Partially. Unicri has uh, more than 800 millions every year from the Italian government. No, uh, uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. No, it's, uh, it's millions, but it's not 800. Yeah, okay, no, okay. Right, no, 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 no. We will have it, because... No, 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 800, it's, no, no, much less, much less. Yeah, they do. But uh, still uh, is, uh, is uh, on, on the roll payment, on the payment of the Italian government. 
for so the agreement in, with United Nations. Yeah, okay. So in, in terms of uh, production of research, it's quite far from what it could be. Eh? But also is on the market, which means Unicre is applying for projects, European projects, other projects. Uh, it's brilliant sometimes, yes, of course. Uh, well, uh, for a research institute, uh, having a, a plafond of money for living, it's uh, very uh, relevant because you can spend your time. Uh, in the case of transcarmine, the difficulty is that you can live if you take a project. You don't have a, a basic money coming from the university. You have a basic office, which means uh, the university provides us with the ITER, the office, a uh, uh, few posts of Professor Francesco, Serena, and Alberto. Now they're becoming, they pay the salaries, but the rest is paid on the projects. Yeah, okay. So you have to earn your money. But I mean, you are right. You were the only professor. Now that you are, that you have three. Today we have a Francesco full professor, uh, Serena, who is becoming associate professor, and uh, uh, Alberto, who is researcher, uh, who, who will become soon associate professor also. So mainly three. So on, 20, on 23, yeah. Yeah, but this means that you have a future there. Some, uh, yeah, no, no, for sure. Really Francesco, smart. the division of labor is Francesco is dealing with PhD and the master program. I'm dealing with ranch crime, so there is a division of labor. Yeah, okay. Now, in any case, I have uh, wonderful uh, memories of going to uh, to Milano to the meetings there. Uh, it was uh, really great. Even I don't know if we are forgetting something. Eh? We can yeah. have, if there are any. Final, of course, uh, words on all the most important challenges, apart from the um, study of the costs of crime, are there other aspects which really need more um, attention in the Italian criminology of the 21st century? Many of the things I said, predictive criminology, cost of crime, um, are in some ways uh, addressed to law enforcement. Uh, uh, that are the people with whom we work or, or from where we take uh, the analysis. Uh, I know that in Italy it's very difficult uh, the cooperation between public uh, and academia, uh, uh, more difficult than in other countries. But probably we need to insist, uh, hoping that the new generation of police people will be much more open than today. So it's just a nope, uh, but it's also a challenge. On the other side, we need to explain more with a very simple language why some analyses are very useful uh, uh, to police. They want to know results, uh, which means they want to know something concrete that could really help them to do their job. This uh, means uh, it's also for us uh, an effort. We need to speak a simple language, the same thing for the students also. Uh, a simple language with uh, merging the theoretical capabilities and practical capabilities also, explaining the policy relevant issues which are behind the crime and play, situational prevention, particularly criminology, all these things. This will take a lot of time. This will take a lot of time. And the data issue, it's becoming very relevant. We need absolutely data in Italy and in Europe. We are soliciting the European Commission to collect much better data on organized crime and economic crime today. So it's a, a cycle where we do analysis, we ask for better data, they will push for better data. Marcelo knows through Eurostat how many developments there have been in collecting better data at European level. They've been producing data about cybercrime and uh, money laundering, uh, very dirty data, but at least better than nothing. This yeah. is the better than nothing. Uh, with this kind of uh, better than nothing, uh, my approach is always do, because it's better than nothing. Yeah. I, I fully agree. Uh, I think it's a, a challenge everywhere. I mean, getting better data because the climate is also getting much more complicated from a um, point of view of privacy and so on. Getting data is becoming more difficult now in some countries than it was 20 years ago. For example, in Belgium, getting data from the local police 
used to be just take your phone and ask for the data. And now, of course, the GDPR, uh, it's important, um, but it complicates matters also for surveys and international surveys, um, this tension between research uh, and privacy. It's and wonderful how you can do this in Italy if you can get a good cooperation with the police, fantastic. Um, because in the long run, I think cooperation is always better. There is a, a lot of discussion inside the European Union, especially at Europol level, for the data exchange. Um, today, the discussion is very intensive because uh, they are supporting a lot of projects uh, for uh, data, but on the end, uh, police uh, is not able to provide for the privacy, privacy issue data to the academic. So on the end of the story, you get the money for doing nothing or almost nothing because the police does not give you the data. Only uh, today, this is a problem that should be solved in a way because the pumping money for no data, it's absolutely uh, narcissistic. In a way or in the other, uh, the uh, excuse is the privacy, which does not work because there could be some caveat in uh, controlling the use of this data that could provide an exchange data between uh, police and academic. I think it will come soon. It will come soon. And two quick last things that I wanted to ask you, because we have, while doing this um, podcast and discussing, um, there is one thing that arrived without even searching for it is, uh, the change in the profile of, of crime uh, in each country. Eh? If yeah. you compare when you when you started in the uh, second half of the 80s, when you became a professor, and uh, how how crime has changed in Italy, would you say? Yeah, no, no, it's true. I, I started with a lot of homicides in Italy, and uh, where it was very clear, a map of the homicides in Italy was a concentration of 11 percent on uh, the central Italy, where there were the mafia association, Sicily, Campania, and Calabria. You had uh, four uh, homicides every 100,000 uh, in inhabitants, and on Campania, Sicily, and Calabria, there were 11. Today, today these data are completely different. You have a, a very low number of homicides, uh, no difference between uh, regions with exceptions for some years, uh, which means the data don't speak, uh, at least uh, the mafia issue in Italy is no more a big issue, for at least from the homicides point of view. From the economic point of view, it's a good issue, but it's a relevant issue, for, but from the homicides point of view, it's not. Today, um, according to the last data, but uh, you can put a question mark on the end uh, where cyber crime, frauds, cyber fraud. But this is a, co a common trend. You know, Marcelo and Levin, that uh, the number of unreported crimes on cyber crime is very relevant. Dark number there, it's absolutely relevant. If homicides could point out a trend uh, today when you speak about cyber crime, together, because cyber crime is a category which is where you can find. Um, fraud and uh, uh, credit cards, uh, clone, everything else under the cybercrime. So uh, the problem is that uh, because people are becoming aware of phishing or the other things are reporting more, and that of reported crime shows that uh, for sure there is more cybercrime. When you go on another segment, for example, today, which is very relevant for the public attention, violence against women, we, uh, family violence is a very old crime in Italy, as elsewhere, but the attention is now not when I started doing criminology. So today, once again, people are reporting more. Uh, we don't know if uh, these crimes are occurring more, no. but for sure they are reporting more. So if I measure the reported crimes, I find a trend. But for sure, uh, if we started with uh, homicides and mafia homicides, we are ending on the end of my cycle with uh, uh, violence against women or family violence and cybercrime. Yeah. 
also theft did who was i mean even in the way criminology was taught in the 70s the place of uh, uh, of theft of property crime was quite important eh? was very important yes but today uh, the number of theft uh, is still relevant because theft is, is the most relevant crime that uh, is present in the statistics but uh, uh, the attention of the people today when i speak about the attention is the relevance of the issue in the newspapers uh, in the public bodies uh, which means uh, such as terrorism which was a uh, very few cases, but a lot of attention. It's a violence, family violence, uh, uh, pedophilia, uh, and uh, cybercrime, for sure. So, so maybe it's, I think, in some way, Garland says this, we, we learn to live with theft somehow, huh? Yeah. So probably after the war, it was not so, so common a crime, but then, then people no, were surprised. It has, it has moved to, to private protection, prevention, which means uh, you, if you want, you know that you can't uh, eliminate theft, which is, uh, but you can prevent it with technology. So this is something which goes to situational prevention quite easily. Yeah, yeah I mean, because the idea, if we, we mentioned uh, Barat at the beginning you know, of his idea that crime would disappear when uh, we would live in a, basically he says when we change this, if we go to a socialist uh, society, crime will disappear. This has been, I think, mostly completely abandoned eh, in, uh, in practice. Yeah, but you remember Barata and the other people such as Bricola, critical criminology, were insisting a lot on explaining the reasons of crime. Today, we are moving to the crime consequences, which means uh, uh, also because it's been very difficult, uh, also in theories, to have different uh, theories about crime, the private people, rich people, uh, all these things. So in the end, uh, I think we have been moving, uh, because of situational prevention also, to the other side of the crime, which means, uh, can we please prevent the consequences of crime, can reduce crime? So this is something which has gone through uh, theories. Uh, today, of course, you have a lot of people belonging to critical criminology, state crime, it's a relevant issue, state corruption uh, could be in Europe or in Latin America, but uh, I don't see a, a lot of future of course, when you go on terrorism or organized crime, we have the complexity of involving the state, you have the complexity of involving the, the groups, uh, cultural groups, uh, the other things. But in the normal people, the perception of crime is theft you need to prevent on your own. Remember that the main issue people are, the main attention is on violence. So, because the people, so homicides, family homicides, violence against people, gangs, for example, today we are once again in Italy experimenting the development of juvenile gangs, which is an old problem which is coming back once again. I think things are moving, going out and coming back once again. Juvenile gangs in Italy are becoming a very big issue. That's nice because then you give us a view of, uh, of uh, crime also in your country. And, uh, and my last question would be if you Publish again your, your you have this book well, that we talked before starting the uh, the podcast um, uh, the book with the uh, Barbali uh, sociology of deviance. Eh? If you would publish it today, would you still call it sociology of deviance or would you call it criminology? Criminology. I think that also you, from what I learned when I was uh, going uh, to uh, to Milano, that the department of sociology has lost a lot of. Um, students while you are winning all the time, eh? Yeah. Sociology was a very well-known discipline uh, on, uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but uh, um, uh, in terms of prestige and relevance is going down and down. Uh, when criminology goes up, uh, sociology goes down. This is the reason why criminologists don't want to mix with sociologists. Okay, that's a good that's a good point. <laughs> a good point too. Yeah, I don't know, Levin, if you have any any other questions. I talk too much today. Sorry, but um, I, I mean, I know did... the history so well. So um... <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been in touch with the Italian criminology since the beginning, eh? Because one of the first things I did when I um, 
I was still a PhD student, was to go to um, Garda, to Garniano del Garda, to this fraternity, yeah. and they, there was beautiful this- Beautiful place, beautiful site. place. And there was this meeting, not the Italian society, that it was the, the Association of French-speaking criminologists, but no, then no, no. almost immediately, uh, Uberto started inviting me to go to the Italian Society of Criminology, no. and then we met and I started going to Milano, so um, I am always, and you know that I have from my mother's side, uh, yeah. a whole part of the family who comes from Italy, yeah? so uh, that would be Mucchi Grosso. Uh, Marcelo is, Marcelo is a well-known uh, foreigner <laughs> everywhere or citizen of many different countries. Yeah, but uh, in any case, I love Italy. And so for me, it was really interesting to discuss. We, yeah. do, we, we discussed many topics. Uh, so it's, it was a fascinating interview. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thanks to you both. Well, uh, I'm very happy. And thanks once again for this invitation. I hope it works uh, and this will help us to um, uh, grow other people, uh, hoping they will continue our job. Exactly. The collective memory. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ciao Marcelo. All the best. Ciao Lieben. Thank you for following Lieben and Marcelo's Criminology Podcast. This podcast is edited by Eduardo Coco from the University of Lausanne. Our theme song is Seagull's Night, Noche de Gaviotas, composed by Gustavo Cantero, arranged by Tato Germano, and played by Tato and Gustavo with the voices of Sasha Conte and Alejandro Turco Gujot. Your host are Levin Powells from Ghent University, Belgium, and Marcelo Aedi from the University of Lausanne, Switzerland. Cheers and see you soon.